Bills. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The group calling itself the Freedom Convoy has now left the Northwest and is on its way to Ottawa. Hundreds of transports and other vehicles are taking part in the cross-Canada rally against vaccine mandates for cross-border truckers. The group made an overnight pit stop on the outskirts of Thunder Bay last night and despite some traffic tie-ups and a brief confrontation with reporters, police say the protesters were mainly peaceful. Kurt Black has the details. After being welcomed by hundreds of supporters in places like Kekebeka Falls and other parts of the region, the majority of the Freedom Convoy, made up of hundreds of transport trucks and personal vehicles, spent the night at the local dirt track speedway. The caravan departed Thunder Bay early in the morning with OPP stationed along their departure route to ensure traffic continued to flow safely. OPP Sergeant Mike Golding notes it was a tall order when dealing with such a large line of vehicles, but he was pleased with how everything went. Our intention was to, uh, you know, keep the local traffic moving as, as quickly and regularly as possible. So uh, we did utilize the traffic lights. Uh, we think that was just a fair way to, uh, to deal with it and also allow the group to catch up with itself so they don't get stretched, you know, to a point where there's a, a very large uh, distance and gap between them. Um, but it, appeared, it appears to me that uh, it was quite orderly and uh, we're very happy with the way that that turned out. Aside from a small number of agitators that were aggressive towards news reporters on scene Wednesday night, referring to them as communists, the majority of the convoy have traveled peacefully on the stretch between Kenora and Thunder Bay. Golding says they've been cooperative with police. Uh, we automatically we had some ongoing communication with the event organizers to ensure that uh, you know, our mandate of public and traffic safety was met and uh, that the convoy participants were being orderly and peaceful, which they were. And it, was, uh, it was well done. Um, it is my understanding that, you know, it's been a positive relationship and with, we've had no negative incidents uh, through their, their time basically between Kenora and Thunder Bay, so uh, we're happy about that. Thunder Bay police were also monitoring the convoy's activities in the city and in Oliver Papoonge. Acting Traffic Sergeant Sal Carcidi wanted to thank local commuters for the cooperation during the convoy's short time in the area. So we just wanted to thank the, the motoring public and the commuters in Thunder Bay and Oliver Papoons for being able to adapt to the changing situation, uh, the increased traffic on our roadways, uh, as well as allowing extra time to get from point A to point B. Uh, even with a last minute schedule change by the organizers today, uh, we were able to respond to that and have the trucks moving safely through the city. After leaving Thunder Bay, the convoy split into two at Nipigon, with smaller vehicles continuing on Highway 17 towards Sault Ste. Marie and the transports headed north on Highway 11 towards Cochrane. Kurt Black, TBT News. And we'll have more on that convoy as it travels through Ontario a little later in the news hour. The new Thunder Bay Police Headquarters is off the table at least for a year. The police board met this week and decided to delay its $56 million funding request to the city as the service works through several human rights complaints and other internal issues. News of the delay took center stage at last night's city budget meeting, causing a fair bit of confusion. Vasilios Bellos explains. The memorandum put forward came after the police services board met on Tuesday. It contained a motion that focused on their potential new headquarters, looking to reduce the request to the city for $56 million in support of the project and reducing the 2022 recommendations to $2.4 million. There was no decision made at the meeting, council deciding to push a vote until next week. It was put forward by Mayor Bill Morrow, who provided an explanation for the change. To say simply to, to the group um, that the police services board met yesterday and simply made a decision that given everything that's going on, and I appreciate that the council will not see a need to ask questions about that because so much of that is confidential in nature. Given everything that's going on, that this is just not the right time for a capital project of this magnitude to move forward. Many councillors were unsure about the changes that would come with the memorandum. Many also questioned exactly where the $2.4 million would go if approved. City Manager Norm Gale said this funding would give the city a better understanding of the potential police headquarters itself. No matter what happens tonight, we will not be further ahead on what the project would look like. That's what the $2.4 million is for, is to find that information. 
And the second thing is, what would the $2.4 million be spent on? Uh, project management, design professionals, site analysis and securement of property, advancement of the building program to sch schematic design is Police services was also discussed. Councillor Aldo Roberta hoping to add over $955,000 to add seven first-class officers. Police Chief Sylvie Hoth was present and shared her thoughts on the potential influx of funds. I will never say no to put, putting more staff on the road. We are extremely busy. What we see nowadays, uh, you are correct, are much more serious calls for service. They're time-intensive in terms of resources. Um, they necessitate way more than one officer on the scene, given the severity. Councillor Aldo Roberto's additional funding did not find support from fellow councillors, resulting in no overall changes to the budget coming from the meeting. Vasilio Spellos, TVT News. Meanwhile, there are new developments in that dispute within the police board. The lawyer for a member, George Ann Morisot, alleges her client was excluded from board meetings after Morisot filed a human rights complaint last fall and then publicly criticized police leadership. We have a witness who um, told member Morisot that there had been board meetings, many board meetings, in her absence since December 2020. Um, that is something that will come out and be tested in adjudication before the Human Rights Tribunal. Bryson Wants, an adjudicator from the Ontario Civilian Police Commission, brought in immediately to assume control of the board and look into Morisot's accusations. Bryson insists that's fair, saying all board members could now be in conflict of interest when dealing with Morisot's complaints. We've been going through this repeatedly with the board since filing her complaints that they are in conflict. They're all in conflict. They are personally named respondents with named damages amounts. They have financial interests in these matters. Police Board Secretary John Hannum has responded to the accusations, saying the board has never met without inviting Morisot to attend. Hannum went on to say that Morisot has attended every meeting held by the board except for the last hastily arranged meeting on Tuesday to discuss delaying the budget request for the new police headquarters. The number of COVID-19 patients is up today at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre. The hospital now has 46 COVID cases. That's five more than yesterday. The number of those patients in the ICU has held steady at six. The overall hospital occupancy rate is nearly 101 percent, while the intensive care is 86 percent full. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit no longer updates its COVID-19 numbers on Thursday, but there are now 369 active cases in the Northwestern Health Unit, up from 300 on Wednesday. The seven-day testing positivity rate is 24.2 percent. There are three people in hospitals situated in the NWHU's catchment area, with nobody in the ICU. We're learning more about what Ontario's reopening will look like next week, and the Ford government says some non-urgent surgeries and medical procedures that were put on hold earlier this month will resume in stages starting on Monday. After two long years of fighting COVID-19, Ontario's top doctor believes the province is ready to move on. We have to uh, understand with Omicron that we uh, can't eliminate this threat, uh, that uh, in fact we have to learn to live with it. But learning to live with the virus in Ontario also means peeling back the tools to know how the virus is spreading in Ontario. The province has already limited PCR testing. It has shortened the isolation period and is now effectively doing away with contact tracing. The amount of virus in the community is not such that case individual, case and contact management uh, uh, will have any benefit. So as businesses prepare to reopen next week, they are being told they no longer have to track who dined in and when. And public health units are being told their primary focus now is on vulnerable sectors. To work with our long-term care partners, those that are in shelters, uh, the, those high-risk congregate settings uh, where they're trying to uh, protect those patients and populations uh, through outbreak management. The pivot in Ontario's pandemic approach comes after a cycle of closures that created economic shockwaves. Now there are calls for stability going forward. I really can't stress this point enough. We have to ensure that this reopening sticks. 
our small business owners simply can't afford another lockdown. We have to keep moving forward. But is the province moving forward too quickly? In another major change, the government is reopening the concession stands inside movie theaters, indoor sporting events and concert venues as long as people remain seated. The province's health advisors say it will cause more hospitalizations. I think this will happen now with the 31st of January. We need to, uh, to deal with it, but everybody shall take it slow. Don't rush this, please. Monday's reopening in Ontario won't just focus on the economy, but on the hospital system as well. After pausing non-urgent surgeries and procedures, the Ford government says diagnostic and cancer screening will resume on January 31st, while some hospitals will be able to resume surgeries on a limited basis. That was CTV's Colin Mello reporting. A suspicious death is being reported in the town of Fort Francis. Members of the Rainy River OPP were dispatched to a Portage Avenue business Tuesday morning. A 37-year-old man from Lac La Croix was pronounced dead on the scene and a post-mortem was conducted in Kenora yesterday. Investigators believe there is no threat to public safety. Any information that can assist investigators should be directed to the OPP or Crime Stoppers. Martin Falls First Nation has declared an education state of emergency. Nearly all elementary school children in the remote community have been out of class for more than 100 days as there's only a kindergarten and native language teacher left to teach them. Henry Coaster Memorial School has been nearly empty for more than three months due to teacher recruitment issues, the main reason being a lack of housing in Martin Falls. There's no dedicated residence for teachers and they have to share the, fewer room, the few rooms available at the seniors' residence. The issue was first raised to federal officials in 1999 and there's been little headway since. Chief Bruce Asni Paneskum reached out again in September and was promised they'd get back to him. You know, and each unit up north is, is approximately uh, 350,000 to 400,000. So, you know, you can, you can do the math that uh, there's no investments in, in, in coming to our community anytime soon. Ashley Paneskum recently sat down with riding MPP Guy Bourgeois to call for assistance. It's also been taken up by MP Charlie Angus of the NDP. Martin Falls is in his federal riding. Students at Algonquin Avenue School here in Thunder Bay had a great winter experience this week. The Borealis dog sled team taught the kids about the sport and offered rides around the playground. Jessica Clement has the story. Students and faculty alike were excited for the dog sled rides provided by Borealis Dog Sled Adventures, which is based out of Vermilion Bay. The kids got a chance to meet with professional guides and their dogs and learn about the historical and cultural significance of dog sledding. School principal Darren Lentz says this experience is great for getting kids learning outside and bringing it into the classroom. We want to try to give students experiential opportunities and you know what better way to experience the outdoors and experience um, you know linking it to some of the curriculum than by providing sort of an adventure experience for the kids. The guides were also excited about bringing this experience to the children and teaching them about the history of dog sledding. I think it's great for the kids. Uh, get them outside. It's, uh, it's a great activity. Uh, get them fresh air and then uh, also to learn about the, the traditional ways and dog sledding. The students we spoke to were very enthusiastic about the experience and were excited about the change of pace from being in the classroom. Uh, it, was, it was really good. I like how they all work together and they just, once they go, they go. It's very awesome uh, that they were able to bring them in. Something new, not the same old things that we do yearly and a new experience. It's a really fun experience that I think a lot of schools should do this, um, especially in wintertime. Because uh, I feel like you can learn a lot from this. The dog sledding rides have been a positive learning experience for the students at Algonquin Avenue Public School and will hopefully be an experience that they remember for a long time. Jessica Clement, TVT News. Well, what a great time that is. I have been dog